1996, the people of Virginia, Brazil, witnessed a UFO event that would change their lives forever. Só que ele pleinava, ia perdendo lentamente a altitude e ia caminhando. Call it another Roswell, if you will. It is a crashed vehicle that had beings on board. Mas que eles não poderiam admitir a verdade, a população ia entrar em colapso. Nada temos a esconder. Finally, the facts will be revealed. The Virginia case is considered the most well-kept secret in the military circles of Brazil. All right, I'm not going to play the entire intro, uh, nor will I play the entire documentary, which I've now watched. And I went back and watched um, James Fox's first documentary uh, called The Phenomenon, which basically documents UFOs and the the phenomenon throughout history when it started. The best examples. Uh, good. Is it morning? It's afternoon. Good afternoon, people. Good morning, West Coast. Uh, it, I think this might be a part of my childhood that I've actually never or not yet exposed to the world. I've always been into fishing. I've always been into rocks, minerals, and fossils. And I've always been into UFOs or the idea concept of when I was a kid. And you guys may remember you had those scholastic books at school and you'd have to pick your books. And I would get fishing books. And I would get alien books and Guinness Book World Records stuff, like, like th that type of stuff. I've always been into it. Uh, never had an encounter. Do not judge people who claim to have had encounters, but I've always loved it, been fascinated by it. I forget who said it, uh, but someone said, you know, the only thing scarier than uh, life on other planets is if there's no life on other planets. Um, and so this is good. This is amazing. I'm, I'm, I'm listening to Joe Rogan while I'm driving. Where was I driving? It was a long drive. I don't remember when it was. Uh, and I'm listening to James Fox on Joe Rogan talking about stuff that I've loved since my childhood. But, uh, you know, as life progresses, I've gotten more into the fishing, uh, back into the rocks and minerals. But I hadn't gotten back into the, into the UFOs, aliens and those types of things. I love it. Like the famous show goes, I want to believe. And I do believe. But... I watched the documentaries and they're fascinating. Everybody should watch them. And then I reached out to James. He replied and it's happening, people. Okay, uh, share the link around. We're live now. I'm going to make sure that we are live on all platforms. We should be live on Rumble. Are we? We are. We should be live on Locals. VivaBarnesLaw.Locals.com. Locals, are we live? Okay, it looks like we're live. Okay. Uh, now, oh, hold on. I've had this screen up the entire time, people. You haven't been able to see my... My beautiful fatigued face. Okay, James Fox, documentarian, uh, directed, produced. I'm not sure if he produced, but directed. Well, you know what? James is going to explain himself. James, I'm bringing you in in three, two, one. Good morning, sir. Good afternoon. How goes the battle? Thank you so much for having me on. This is uh, it's, it's exciting. It, well, it's exciting for me because like I I was I was listening to you on Rogan. I'm listening to the story of Virginia, which I've never I I had never heard of. I had heard Joe talking about it before the podcast with you. And I was like, oh, I really should probably look into that. Hadn't heard it. 94, I was 14 years old and into other things. Uh, James, okay, before we get into anything, uh, let's do like the standard 30,000 foot overview. We'll get into the details and, and some new developments. But who are you? Where are you from? What'd your parents do? How many siblings did you have? And Or do you have? And how on earth did you get into the, I say the niche, the career of UFO documentarian? It's crazy, right? So my father was uh, was a was a journalist, Charles Fox, and he had uh, multiple sclerosis. He was diagnosed. He's British. I was born in England and he was diagnosed, I think, at like 24 years old. And uh, it as you know, he had I guess he had the, the there was the most chronic version of MS where it basically starts taking your legs out. Then you become a paraplegic and then it moves its way up into your arms. Then you're a quadriplegic. And then it, it eventually goes up into your throat and, and you're done. And uh, so I traveled around the world with my father. I was his sort of his uh, secretary. I was his nurse. I was his physical therapist. I was his chauffeur. Um, and uh, he would pick interesting topics and write for these different magazines. Uh, Rolling Stone, Car and Driver, Automobile, PC Computer Magazine. We got to meet... Um, Theoretical physicist Stephen Hawking a couple of times in England. 
it was really cool because they're both in wheelchairs and they're both doing pretty extraordinary stuff, uh, particularly <laughs> Stephen Hawking and uh, race car race car legend uh, Dan Gurney, and just got to do really cool stuff. And so I was exposed to journalism, I guess, pretty early on as a kid, watching my father do it and interview people, and I was fascinated. Um, then we sort of fast forward. I was in my very actually, I was about twenty years old, and the you know, the digital cameras started becoming popular, you know, the prosumer level cameras where you could grab a camera, go in the field. There was no processing. It was instantaneous playback. And I thought, wow, what a great medium for reporting and, and documenting things. So I got really into that. And I'm giving you, I'm trying to give you the relatively brief overview. Let me just get into a, a little more detail. Born in England. How many years did you live in England before coming to America? A couple years. And then I moved to Brooklyn and I spent a couple years in Brooklyn. All right. And siblings wise, are you an only child? Two sisters, Two older, sisters. And, older and younger. My younger is a nurse. My, the, uh, the older was a real estate agent, lives in uh, Colorado. And your mom? My mom's Romanian and she's passed, unfortunately. Okay. Yeah. Um, okay so your dad's a journalist. Yes. You, you've been in America for your conscious life. So yeah. Yeah. And yeah. Brooklyn. Okay. Amazing. And you grew up with your dad being a and journalist. My mother. Yeah. Back and forth. I would go back and forth from Southern California, Northern California. Oh, they, they, they were, they were divorced. They, they separated. Yeah. They separated when I was like five. Okay. Yeah. Middle child, middle boy of a separated family. Father's a journalist. Okay. Interesting. We have, we, we have some broader context now and all right. So, and, and, and schooling it as a teenager, what, what type of teenager are you? Troublemaker? Pretty, uh, pretty. Oh, uh, I was, you know, I had, I had some issues. <laughs> How old are you, by the way, if I might ask that first? I just turned 50. I actually turned 55 on Joe Rogan's show. Tab out. Happy birthday. Thank and you. You, you carry it well. You look very good. 55. I don't look a day over 54. <laughs> <laughs> so a bit of a troublemaker. You're, are you a troublemaker as a teenager? Where are you growing up? You're growing up in New York as a teenager? Well, uh, no, I grew up in uh, I grew up in kind of in a rural, rural area, a um, place called, well, I don't like to usually give it out, but it's a, it's, 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 it's a fishing community. It's, it's rural. It's about an hour north of, of, of San Francisco, rural, surrounded okay. by millions of acres of open space fishermen, you know, uh, small town, everybody knows everybody. And I would go back and see my mother was down in Los Angeles. So I'd kind of go back and forth. And, um, but I guess I kind of was relatively on my own at an early age because of my father's condition, you know, he, he lost his mobility. And so I, I mean, I was doing stuff at 11, I was driving cars. And I remember doing an interview with this guy, Dan Gurney, I talked about earlier, where I was God, I couldn't have been 14. Maybe I was 13, 13 or 14. And we're down in Los Angeles and my father could move his upper, his arms for a while and he would drive the car, the, the, the van with one hand and he'd have the throttle with the other hand, right? So you had the brake and the throttle. But sometimes his, his spasticity levels, particularly because of heat, would get so bad, like he's like, I can't drive. You have to drive. So he puts me behind the wheel of this van. I'm, I'm telling you, I was like 13 or 14. And I'm like, dad, I've driven like in the parking lots. I've driven in you know rural areas. I've never driven on a freeway in Los Angeles before. He goes, it's okay, son. Just keep it between the lines. <laughs> That's what he said. That's Just, I'm driving this van. So we pull up in this parking lot to meet with Dan Gurdy. And Dad's looking at my dad and looking at me. He's like, uh, excuse me, Charles, but how old is your son? <laughs> like, Does he have a driver's license? <laughs> yeah that's incredible it, it, your, your dad is still alive no he passed no. unfortunately yeah he and passed. so i mean I, I i don't have any life experience with the condition um does it, it ends up taking your essential your breathing function away or you know what happened was it just and my father was a jovial he was an inspiration he was a pleasure to be around he was the he was the light in the room. I mean, he was cracking everybody up. Never pity poor me. He did more things as a quadriplegic than anybody. He actually designed and had built his own portable lifting device. So you could like take it out of a black duffel bag, put it together and then crank the arm and it would lift him out of bed. So people that weren't strong enough to take him in and out of beds or in and out of the wheelchair could have this portable lift. And he was talking to some of the doctors when he was designing it. He was like, why isn't anything like this available? And the doctors was like, well, to be honest with you, Charles, most quadriplegics don't really travel. <laughs> You're going all around the world. And so my father was kind of a pioneer in that respect. And, um, and, and um, 
yeah, he was just a real, he was a real, he was just a real uh, pleasure and inspiration to be around. And it's funny, so I'll tell you this, when I told my father that I was interested in UFOs, I was probably 24, he was just beside himself. I mean, he was like, son, please. He literally said to me, it's a dead end street. There's nothing to it. You're wasting your life. So then he had like our family writing, please talk some sense into James. He's going down this dead end street with this UFO stuff. And they were pleading with me. Your father's very concerned like you. And and um, so the the level of resistance I got in my own family when I first embarked on this journey all those years ago was significant. And um, eventually I, I, I took my father, I finished my first doc by the time I was 28. It's called UFOs, 50 Years of Denial. And I managed to get an interview with Apollo 14 astronaut Edgar Mitchell, uh, six man to walk on the moon, which was impressive. He talked about Roswell and whatnot. And then that led me to another interview I got with, uh, with, um, uh, uh, William, uh, sorry, what am, what am I drawing a blank? Mercury astronaut Gordon Cooper. And for that interview, normally I would take, my dad would take me to his interviews. Well, this time I took my father and that guy was an iconic figure in my father's generation. He was the last American astronaut to go up in space alone. And, you know, he was just very famous. And he talked about this landing case at Edwards Air Force Base, these encounters that he had over Germany in the late fifties. And my father was really moved by that. Like he thought, my God, this guy is not selling his story. He's got everything to lose, nothing to gain. And I think that's when my father started to pay attention. And when my dad died 10 years ago, he was one of my biggest fans. That's amazing. I mean, so you get into it you're tw at 24, it becomes a passion. It, as a teenager growing up, it wasn't even on the horizon? No. Funny enough, I dated this girl named Rachel Miller. And um, I was 18. She was 19. And she told me her previous boyfriend was super into ufos and i remember thinking what a freak like i can't believe she would date a guy into ufos that's so weird you know what i mean like i just had this immediate in fact we had a friend of the family's who was a pilot his name was michael gardner and and i would say like every couple of years he'd come over for family you know thanksgiving christmases or whatever he's british and he would talk about this UFO sighting that he had. It was a pretty damn good UFO sighting. But I was at the dinner table. I remember just like, I'd almost just tune out while he would talk about it. And then, of course, years later, I was like, Michael, can you tell me about your UFO? He's like, well, I've told you five times before. I was like, yeah, but now I'm interested. Like, what, <laughs> what happened, you know? So. Uh, did you, do you study journalism or what, what did you study in university? Believe it or not, I studied French of all things. <laughs> I speak French. That's like one of my one of my that's one of my few accomplishments in college. Well, that's I mean, we could we could do a portion of this interview in. I'm I'm from Quebec, so that's our that's our second language for the anglophones in, in the province. Yes, but, I know. I, I go up there and I speak French every now and again. I'm like, it's funny good. just to like, you know, just to drive from here just two hours and everyone's speaking French. It's pretty amazing. It is amazing. It's amazing. Well, it, it, yeah, I'm I'm jealous of the the where you live geographically because it's a beautiful place and and trees and mountains and fresh water and clean cold water I should say. Yeah. But we got you know winter. We got summer and winter here, so it's 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 beautiful. All right. So so we're contextualizing all this now. Yes. 24, 27. You start getting in. You you'd make the decision to pursue this. Yes. With a, concretely speaking, what does that decision look like? From the day to day, I mean, you have a job, or you're 24, 25, you make a decision to go into UFO research. What does that look like as far as your life, your lifestyle goes? Well, it was, it was, you know, I was parking cars, painting houses. I, I, I was a, a, a bellman at a really fancy hotel in Sausalito, which is just across the Golden Gate Bridge. And um, I always, and I remember my sister, she used to say, like, "Gosh, why are you pursuing these like these these day jobs? You should just." I was like, "Well, it supports." me doing what I love to do, you know, and even though I was making docs, but it would take me like the first doc took me four and a half, four, four and a half years, you know, then I did, then I did it and I sold that to discovery and it aired on the learning channel. And then I made another doc. And every time I finish a doc, I'd always say, that's it. I'm never doing another doc on UFOs ever again. <clears throat> and now I've learned at my ripe old age, not to say that anymore, because you, what happens is you do the doc, suddenly more doors open and you've got a better level of access. Now suddenly I'm interviewing some generals or I'm interviewing cosmonauts or I'm interviewing, you know what I mean? And then I did out of the blue 
And out of the blue, I sold to uh, NBC Universal. It broadcasts to a two-hour special on Sci-Fi. Thank you, Larry Lensman. And um, and then I did a revamped version of Out of the Blue, which took me two more years. I mean, every time you finish a, a project, whatever project that is, you have this like when you when you embark on the project, you have this vision of what you think it's going to be. You know what I mean? Like you kind of see it, and then it doesn't always materialize into that vision. And so I always feel dissatisfied every time I finish a film. I finished Fifty Years of Denial, even though I sold it, it did okay. I was dissatisfied. I made Out of the Blue, dissatisfied, sold it, dissatisfied, pay all the money back. Then I did a second version, revamped, spent two more years on it, two and a half years. Yeah, I was happier, but still dissatisfied. Then I did another film called I Know What I Saw, and that was based on an event I did at the National Press Club with a woman named Leslie Kane, who was one of the journalists who broke the secret Pentagon UFO program on the front page of the New York Times in 2017. ATIP, Advanced Aerospace Threat Identification Program with Christopher Mellon and, and Lou Elizondo. So we had done an event in 2007 at the National Press Club where we flew in 14 military government officials, FAA officials from seven countries, and I made a movie about it. And I, I, it was pretty compelling, like very high level government officials, a couple of generals, you know, talking about the reality of the UFO phenomenon and, and, and asking the U.S. government to... Um, to open up another Project Blue Book, and that was Project Blue Book was the investigatory arm of the Air Force from 47 to 69. It went through a couple of different names. Ultimately, it was Project Blue Book. Um, and it was terminated in 69 or 70. But to, to open up another UFO investig investigation from the United States Air Force, and we were pushing for that in 2007. Anyway, I made a movie about it. I know what I saw. That took me the better part of five years. I sold that to a and e and it was a two-hour special on the history channel i Again, got, I, gotta, I just gotta stop you there like yes. and, and, you it takes you four and a half years to do your first documentary this one takes you five you're living life in the meantime you're working yes. so that yeah. you can make money to continue financing your passion which is this documentary yes. you edit i don't know at night on the weekends yeah. five years yes. ha i'll ask the question you must get asked a lot but how do you know when it's done <laughs> oh my gosh, that's such a good question. That's such a good question. I, I think you're like one of two people in my entire career that's asked me that question. You don't really. Usually what happens is you're out of money. You're you're like when I finished the phenomenon, that took me eight years. I started that when I was 43 from concept. I finished it at 52. Like, think about that. No, it's, I, was it's so broke. I was so broke at times, I couldn't even afford to pay attention. I remember like just going out into the night sky going, God, please, you know, and you'd think like with the level of success that I'd had previously, I'd been on Larry King nine times, like I'd sold all these other films, like you'd think that it would be easier for me to raise money, right? Well, no, not really. You know, some people would come in, I'd get some investment and then that money would run out and then I'd have to find somebody else. And it was just a constant struggle. Fortunately, I know how to edit. I'm an editor as well as I've done camera work. I've, I've, I do. I still edit my own movies right behind us, because even though I have more money now to pay other editors, I really feel like I can't. I need to do it myself. <laughs> I don't know how else to describe that? I know that, that I I do these like I do short minute legal video breakdowns and like I don't want anybody editing it because a, a change of a phrase can change an entire meaning. Like one one out of context clip or misinterpreted clip can change the entire meaning. Yeah, and 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 artistic theoretical conceptual control over it um so you, you do your own i mean okay sorry i do and here's the thing is i don't do i I, know, I don't write a script i don't write a script ahead of time people think i'm crazy like how could you not write a script well in the long run yeah it's definitely more time consuming but it's the film will write itself like if you have you go through the content it's a very time consuming process that i do but i found a a, a, a process that works and that is I'll shoot, I'll have an objective. Okay, I want to find out what happened in Brazil. I want to get as many high, credible, compelling eyewitness testimony people as I possibly can. And that's a story in itself, and I won't bore your audience with that whole process. But when I'm done, I go and I color, I watch it all, and I color correct, I color code all the different interviews, and I put them in categories. Like I got Act 1, Act 2, Act 3. And then I have levels and different colors 
And with the purple is like, hey, this is a really compelling. This needs to get in the film. And then I give them, I raise them up in the timeline. And so I do that. And once that process is done, I organize the whole thing. And then I start putting the film together. And then I stitch the scenes with, narr with narration. So it kind of almost writes itself mm -hmm. when I do it that way. A lot of people think I'm crazy. They think it'd be a much more streamlined process if I wrote the script ahead of time. But quite honestly, you don't know what you're going to get once you start filming, right? Okay, that's amazing. And, 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 you know, four and a half, five years at the end, other than having to make the decision that it's done either because I feel it is or because it needs to be, you then yeah. decide to sell it. And then you have to, you know, decide whether or not it's going to be worth the, 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 the last four and a half, five years of your life. I was, when I finished, when I finished the phenomenon, my son, that's all he'd known when he was born. Daddy's just working on this UFO film. And, and I won't bore your audience again because there's just, my gosh, I get into it. I, I had just, um, you know, doesn't like towards the end of the movie, we were probably a year out. Th suddenly that whole story was plastered on the front page of the New York Times about the secret Pentagon UFO program. Well, that extended the film two years because that came out. I was like, I got to cover that. Right now, I got to get interviews with former Senate Majority Leader Harry Reid. I got to get interviews with the Intel folks that walked the evidence out of the Pentagon on the front page. I got to interview the New York Times. I got to do, you know what I mean? Like, so that just added on. And, the, and even if you have investors with money, you can't just keep going back to the well. Like, they're like, look, man, you've already asked for this much. You didn't get it done. We can't just keep giving you money. So I'm usually like begging and pleading for money the last, just to get the film across the finishing line. Right. Like, it's, it's, and then the phenomenon was going to be in theaters. First time. I was so excited. Like the ink had dried on the contracts. And I'd just been to China two times prior to that because I was filming in China. And I kept the app of the people that I'd been communicating with. And we had translations as well. And they're like, uh, yeah, this, uh, this virus is coming your way. Sit tight. I was like, no, 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 please. <laughs> Because I was going to be released in theaters, right? Just like two weeks before it was released, it, everything started getting shut down. I was like, no! <laughs> although, like, I don't know, although may maybe if it was, on, when it was released digitally, was it pay-per-view or, or, or purchase Yeah, so on anyway, them? so I'll get to that in a second. I'm dying, man. There's nobody wants this damn thing to go away more than me. I remember my sister calling and she, we were both kind of crying on the phone. I was, she goes, it took a global pandemic to stop you. <laughs> anyway, so so I pivoted to Netflix. Netflix sees the phenomenon and they're like, holy shit. Excuse me, am I allowed to say that? Absolutely. Don't worry. Okay. Right. They're like, holy shit, this is, a, this is unbelievable. That landing case in Africa is like, wow, right? So were, we want to make this into a Netflix original. So that was a big deal. And they brought in another editor and they're going to put their fingerprints on it. And it was going to be great. They offered a big, big money deal. And I was like a million dollars in debt when I finished that movie. I mean, I just had credit cards maxed out. Ugh. And um, just after a month and a half of negotiations, my distributor accidentally under the cloud of COVID had signed a non-exclusive deal with Discovery. And Discovery would not let us unwind that deal. I offered Discovery. $300,000, their money back, plus $300,000 to just walk away, and they wouldn't do it. So the only option I had left was to go to uh, uh, TVOD, Transactional Download, iTunes, Amazon, Google, Fandango, all these options, right? So we put the film out, like, that's how we released the film, the phenomenon, and uh, it became, I mean, it was a pretty... Pretty big, big success. It became a phenomenon, huh? But about being done. Uh, okay, so uh, <laughs> thank I, God, Jesus. Well, I, I can't imagine what it's like. I mean, I can't imagine what it's like being a million dollars in debt. But then you have to make the decision as to how. I mean, you have to make the decision as to how how to get out of it, but also how much it's worth to get out of it. And do you do you do you sell yourself short just to get the short term debt relief? Bird um, in the hand. Is my camera moving? Ah, oh, stupid camera. Hold on, I'm just gonna. All right, so now let's let's get into some let's get into some specifics about uh, UFOs. I'm supposed to ask you about um, somebody named Greer. I'm not sure who he is, Stephen uh -huh. Greer, and I know I'm going to ask you about Tom DeLong because I'm into angels and airwaves and Blink 182, and he's big into the UFO world as well, offering you know he he wants to find the the proof. All right, the UFOs. What, yes, uh, my the number one question. Everyone should watch the phenomenon. Everyone has to watch Moment of Contact. 
we've been we've been like the world has been fascinated with this for since uh, the 40s. Yes. Rogan has an operating theory or at least it's the lore of aliens that the sighting started after the use of nuclear weapons after World War II and that you know the aliens are coming here to save ourselves. My my retort I always hear that and I always remember thinking like there's a lot of tales of sightings and visits and abductions going back. Some people hypothesize that Jacob's ladder out of the Bible is itself uh, some form of alien interaction. What is the actual history like uh, of, of encounters? What's the earliest documented, for lack of a better word, encounter? And let's get us into some of the best cases. But well, all this underlying, why the hell do we not have any just proper video, proper uh, camera footage, proper photograph, photographic evidence of the of the UFOs. Yes. So <clears throat> there is no question that there was a significant uptick in sightings uh, right after we detonated the first atomic bomb at Trinity site in 1945. In fact, I remember being in the edit room of the phenomenon and during the making of the phenomenon. And I was working with this guy, Lance Mungia. I had a couple of other editors come on board and Lance came up with a really good idea. I'd gotten a hold of these really good archive, like news reports, radio reports, newspaper clippings, all original from a guy named David Marler in Albuquerque, New Mexico. He has one of the biggest archives in civilian within the civilian uh, arena. I mean, the guy's amazing. Anyway, and uh, I just put together a little montage of different sightings just to show that these things are happening all over. And my buddy Lance goes, hey, man, we should get a map and put the map up on the editing wall and put pins where these different uh, sightings are occurring. <clears throat> so we did. And I don't know, a couple of weeks into it, we're like, hmm, look at this. This is Socorro here, White Sands, Holloman, Texas. Da, da, da. Look at Trinity. It's right there. Isn't that interesting? I wonder if there's a connection. Like there must be. There must be a connection with the Trinity thing. So anyway... Fast forward, um, I'm interviewing former Senate Majority Leader Harry Reid, which was a big deal for me. He, he was one of the senators that launched this secret Pentagon UFO program, coincidentally, back in 2007, when Leslie Kane and I were at the National Press Club trying to force the government's hand to reopen. Well, they were doing it secretly at, right around the same time, which is kind of funny. But anyway, so I'm asking Senator Reid, hey, what was one of the more extraordinary aspects of the phenomenon that you guys learned? during this 10 year thing. <clears throat> and he goes, without a moment's hesitation, the connection, the fact that they're coming in over the, these incursions into top secret nuclear facilities, uh, and in some cases shutting our, our nukes off, that was probably one of the most extraordinary aspects. So I went back to the drawing board, I contacted the leading expert, this guy, Robert Hastings, who's written the book on it, uh, UFOs and Nukes. and um, probably spent a year on putting together a 10 minute segment of the film, just uh, kind of highlighting that aspect of the phenomenon. So there's no question there's a connection. Okay. And, and flesh that out for those who have not yet seen the phenomenon that a lot of these encounters, a lot yes. and, and people also have to appreciate, like when one refers to a UFO, it's not like necessarily ET green aliens, yeah, for it's sure. unidentified flying objects, which Absolutely. have been in the, in the phenomenon, you have people they're not crazy. They're ex-military guys or they're, they're current military guys yeah. testifying to the fact that there are objects which they had not been able to identify that had um, interactions with, or what's the word I'm looking for, that had an impact on the readiness of nuclear weapons. Yes. And, and they, they don't know how to explain it. It's met, aliens or not, it could be some super amazing Chinese or Russian intelligence. Th there's a number of people within the community that testified to this credibly, and they're not crazy. Who are some of those people, and what were some of those uh, examples of what they were ex uh, explaining? So, look, there, if you, your audience can can do a Google search for Malmstrom Air Force Base in the 60s. I think it was 66, where you have uh, reports from people on the ground whose job is to secure our nuclear weapons during the height of the Cold War and report these uh, a disc-shaped craft that comes in above uh, the site. And then suddenly eight, nine, 10 of their nuclear weapons all just shut off, their missiles shut off. And, and I interviewed, uh, well, Rob, um, 
Hastings has done extensive research on this. He's written a book on it. I have interviewed a number of these people personally, but I've also researched based on the work that Robert Hastings has done and the video testimony that he provided me for the making of the phenomenon. But I did interview a couple of folks, and one in particular was a launch control officer who was at Maelstrom at the time. His name is Robert Salas, Lieutenant Robert Salas. And he said, because I was like, this is unbelievable. Like, this disc's come over. And he, he's like, it's impossible. It shut our, our nukes off. You know, he had all the documentation. And I said, well, what do you make of it? And I'll never forget his, his response. And I could see why he was a launch control officer, because he, had, he was very measured on everything that he said. And he was very calm. His voice was calm. Like, this guy could read bedtime stories to your children. <laughs> he had that kind of voice, you know. And he goes, well, James, the way I see it, it's almost like taking matches out of the hands of a baby, you know? It's like, well, maybe we shouldn't be playing with these things. You know what I mean? So anyway, um, and there's countless reports. Minot Air Force Base is, is incredible, but these, these military installations all across the United States, the vast majority of them, we cover, I don't know, 10 or 12 different cases. And even internationally in Russia, we cover that a case in um, Bentwaters, England, Rendlesham Forest case. That was housing nuclear weapons back in December of 1980. And we got the deputy base commander, Colonel Charles Holt, who had his pocket tape recorder out with his man at night, seeing these objects shooting beams of light down into the weapons storage area. You can Google the tape and, and listen to this guy's uh, so voice. I heard the tape. Phenomenal. Uh, by the way, I'm going to ask you a question and then I'm going to, we're not, it won't change anything on our end. I'm going to go over to Rumble, which is another platform. I'm going to end the YouTube stream, but it doesn't change anything. I'm just going to ask the question here so that everybody knows to go to the Rumble to get the answer. You yeah, I, I heard that part. I heard the recording. And the only thing I'm, I continually ask myself is these incursions are, you know, uh, occurring or they're having these, these incidents at military bases. Is there no CCTV footage? What explains the fact that there's no video footage, video evidence of any of this happening at the most secure uh, locations anywhere? And with that said, everyone on YouTube, you want to know the answer to that question. If there is one, go on over to Rumble. The link is in the well, comments. Answer. All right. And, we're in, and, and I'll see you guys on Rumble in three, two, one. All right. James, what's what's the answer? Like, I mean, I, they, they got to have CCTV footage. They got to have cameras. And they can't they can't capture this. I was I was laughing with uh, with with uh, Ryan Graves. Uh, he's the Navy, one of the Navy pilots that uh, reported these UFOs off the East Coast. Uh, I think it was 2014, 2015. Uh, his mates uh, almost collided with UFOs in their F-18 Navy uh, jets. And every time and look. People think that the government suddenly had this epiphany that the general public deserved to know more about the phenomenon and suddenly like started, you know, pushing for transparency and release of evidence that that is absolutely not the case. What happened was we had a couple of Intel insiders that felt that it was unjustified, the excessive secrecy on this topic and took a huge gamble with their freedom and walked out of the Pentagon with a bunch of uh, evidence and plastered it onto the front page of the New York Times. And now the government can't put the genie back in the bottle. And people wanna know, where's the evidence, right? Well, we have some, we have some photographic evidence, we have some stuff that's leaked out, but one of the things, well, I'm gonna read you something in a minute here that's really, fa I, I really need here. Um, after my latest film, moment of contact. It's one of those cases where I've covered so many cases around the world where you have objects in the sky, particularly landing cases. I've covered a couple of close encounters of the third kind. That's when that's when witnesses report beings, entities associated with the craft. But honestly, I've never really stuck my teeth into. Sure, I've covered Roswell a little bit with the phenomenon. It was you know, I don't know, I think I might have covered it for seven minutes, but I've never dedicated an entire documentary to an alleged crash. And the thing about this case, Moment of Contact, is that there's no black and white. It's either a hoax, which would involve half the town, including the mayor of Virginia, which population 130,000. I don't know what it is today, but hundreds, over 100,000 people. Uh, we've got doctors firemen, policemen, uh, politicians, the mayor, civilians. 
I mean, the list just goes on and on and on. I mean, there are witnesses coming forward every day right now in in Virginia. Some of which I think I shared with you, yeah. the doctors. Well, I, I'm, we're gonna we're gonna pull that up in a bit as well. So, so my whole thing was I'm shifting gears now, and I want to know where is the evidence? Where are these high resolution photographic images, the satellite images? So I have spent the last well, just a couple months ago in Washington, D.C., and I've met with Intel insiders. Now, they can not they can reveal some stuff, but they have to be careful. But they're talking about there's a wall of secrecy. And I, I'm not talking one, I'm not talking two, three, four, five plus people with credentials that I just interviewed. And I'm putting a laser-like focus on where is this evidence? And why can't we see it? And who has the authority to release it, right? We know... When I interviewed Senator Harry Reid, what leaked out of uh, out of the, out of the Pentagon, you know, the Go Fast, the Gimbal, all those all those videos, Tic Tac, Tic Tac's pretty extraordinary case. I mean, you know, you got multiple eyewitnesses, you got radar confirmation, you got visual confirmation, you've got uh, re cockpit recordings on the FLIR. I mean, wow, that's pretty compelling stuff. But according to all these people that I've interviewed, including Senator Harry Reid, who launched the ATIP program, that's just the tip of the iceberg. The real compelling evidence is just behind this wall of secrecy and their justification for not releasing it to us. And I just interviewed people that have seen it, okay? Just a month ago, two months ago. One of them I'm gonna to read to you a little bit about, but in a, in a second. And I'm like, okay, well, why can't, because when they had the congressional hearings, the images that they put forth were a joke. Like half the time I couldn't even see what they were talking about. Like what, what, what is that? Like, Oh, you see this, this little blob, you know, it's like, yeah, sure. Well, so the easier it is for them to, to explain the blurrier, the more ambiguous, the, the more likely we'll be able to see it. The high res satellite imageries, 4k of craft that we can't explain. They do not want that out because they can't explain it. And their justification is what they told me is I think it's ways and means. So that would reveal that maybe we have satellites over that high resolution satellites over Iraq or wherever, you know what I mean? Russia, but they can, you know, erase all that other data doesn't have to tell us exactly where these things are and release it, but they don't want to do it because the more difficult it is to explain, the less likely it'll ever be made public. But I'm, I'm honestly convinced that this, this stuff is coming out, will continue to come out. And Congress, they're getting hip to what's going on right now. And I wanted to read you something, if it's okay, because we're we're gonna talk, we're gonna we're about to get into a crash case, okay? Oh, okay. <laughs> well, but before you bring that up, before you read that, and actually, not only does your explanation, it's a pro it's a proper answer in that what has been what has been revealed has not been voluntarily re revealed. It was, in fact, in the phenomenon that they explained that it was leakers um, who, you know disclosed some stuff uh you know leakily and I, that that's a that's a decent explanation and i'll just show the video uh not settings i don't want to go to settings the tic tac um yep. let me see if i can bring this up here navy pilot I, I don't know this is from pb look at this by the way pbs is an american public broadcast service is spray painted on it on the youtube channel what? so this is yeah th that's weird because they you know they complained when elon musk does it but it seems that uh, youtube's doing it too this is this is some of the one of the footage. I hope it's the good one. Seem like a tic tac. Uh, it looks like this is go fast. Uh, yeah, and then you can hear the you can hear the pilots freaking out because they have no idea what it is, and they have a trained eye. In in larger scale, uh, but white, oblong, no apparent flight control surfaces. No apparent. That's yep. that's that's pretty. Now this one here you're looking at. This one should be the tic tac. I think. Go. Uh, go okay. Play. Let me go back to it here. Uh, That's a cylindrical shaped object. Uh, means of propulsion. Yeah, there we go. And uh, it was maneuvering in a way that we didn't recognize that we couldn't classify. Like I, I, I want to be the, I want to be the, 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 the bona fide skeptic and say, is it possible? It's not just a glitch. Like, is everyone's misinterpreting? It's impossible that what they're misinterpreting here is not what they think it is. It's just they know that this is a, a, a um, an entity. And just don't know how to account for it. It's it's not like this is a, a software glitch or a light refraction. Like it's gotten past that level of scrutiny. They had four eyeballs on it. They chased it for several minutes. It flew rings around their fastest jets. I mean, listen to Dietrich and David Fravor. David Fravor will tell you, like, I was looking at it for several minutes. I interviewed David Fravor. 
that little cat and mouse chase was phenomenal. And he's not only that, but it exhibited like an intelligence because when he, when he saw it down below, like just above the ocean, darting around, he said it was darting around like this above the ocean. There's something below the ocean. He took his plane. He's like, I'm going to go check this out. And he took his plane and he started to spiral down. Okay. When he did that, this object, this tic-tac object that was moving around above the ocean, suddenly just goes, zoop, turns around, and it mimics his movement. It's coming up spiraling, and he's going down spiraling, right? So he's watching this thing. It's getting closer and closer and closer, and he's like, what the hell am I looking at? This object doesn't have any wings. It doesn't have any visible means of propulsion. It's got no exhaust vents. It, how the hell is this thing flying? It's basically a tic-tac an egg, whatever. So he decides to go, you know, to, to, to interrupt the spiral movement and anticipate where the Tic Tac is going to be. And he does this maneuver with his plane where he comes around and he, to get a, a direct line of sight of it. And he said, it took off faster than anything. Like it was almost impossible. Like this, this, nothing that we have can do that all without any wings. Now I'll remind your audience. So there were four sets of eyeballs on this object for several minutes. It wasn't just like a quick for that actually chased this thing. They got radar data of it. And then they got photographic evidence of it from their FLIRs. So yeah, they didn't catch it, but I would say they got just about everything else. How do you explain that? What is that thing? Does Russia have that? Does China have that? Well, the crazy part is, is that I can show you cases dating back in the 40s where people described the same thing. Landing cases in the 60s. Ch you chasing disc-shaped objects in the 50s with, you know, military pilots. And so if it is, look, we all know that the vast majority of UAP or UFOs can be explained. That we know there are weather balloons. We know there are spy balloons. We know all that. Misidentified aircraft. But... There's a core five or 10% of cases like the Fravor case, the Tic Tac off 2004 off the coast of San Diego. Those cases defy a conventional explanation. And those are the cases that I always focus on because they can prove one way or another. What are we dealing with here? Now, there's no question that the phenomenon is real. Okay. That's been admitted at the highest levels. I mean, just go do a little Google. You can see all these government officials saying they're real. The only question is, who is it? What's their origins? What's their intent? Where does it come from? That's that's it. And I'm making the argument, as is most other intelligence folks on the inside, that a certain percentage originate from a non-human intelligence. And that's, that's, I think, a very safe argument at this point all right so given the, the best recent examples tic tac um uh, in terms of video in terms of the video evidence that's been released by the military what are the best examples well, they didn't release it just so you know they did they, not that, that, it, that was leaked <laughs> <laughs> so the, the the best examples that have snuck out it, it made the news a few years ago but what, what are the what are the best examples um the go fast is pretty compelling but um it doesn't exhibit a technology uh, um there's the uh the what's that one that's it's, it's, it's spinning i'm sorry there's go fast there's tic tac there's gimbal the gimbal stuff and there's if you listen to them talking they say there's a whole fleet of them a whole fleet of these objects that were spinning and turning um ryan graves f-18 pilot he went on 60 minutes along with another pilot and they talked about these objects that were sitting off the East Coast, 200 miles off the East Coast, that were just, they showed no propulsion. They were suspended. They were hanging out for 270 days out of the year, just doing whatever they could do. And the Navy couldn't do anything to do to stop them. They, they were aloft for days at a time. How is that possible? What's their propulsion? What's their energy source? They almost collided with them on a couple of occasions. These objects didn't have any wings. They didn't have any tail. They didn't have any air disturbance. They didn't make any, any real noise. Like, what, what's the explanation for that? You know what I mean? 
let, let me bring this one up. This is uh, this is uh, the gimbal. Yeah, uh, the I gimbal. Can, yeah. Yes, I'm gonna do this, and the audio might be a little a little harsh. Dude, this is a fucking drone, bro. There's a whole fleet of them. Look on the ASA. Hear that? Whole fleet of them. Oh my gosh. They're all going against the wind. The wind's 120 knots to the west. The whole thing, dude. I th th this is the military speaking That's like not LNS, though, is it? It's not I do LNS, dude. Well, if there's a like thing, it's rotating. That's, that's absolutely amazing. Okay. And it's amazing, but it's not only that. you got to take the accounts of the pilots of what they're saying. You know, and one of the things that Ryan Graves said to me that right after that video that we just watched, he's an F-18 pilot. He said that the admiral came in the room and they had a debriefing and they showed the video and he watched three seconds of it and he turned around and walked out looking aggravated. I said, Ryan, what, what was that all about? He said, well, to me, that was an indication that he's, he knows about the phenomenon. There's nothing he can do about it. This was nothing new to him. So, you know, I, again, I go back to the, the better the evidence the more qualified the observer, the less likely that the military will is going to want to put forth these cases. I mean, just take the congressional hearings that happened. Andre Representative Andre Carson that organized. You got the like intelligence communities showing you the most like ridiculously just like the worst possible photographic evidence you could possibly imagine. Like, why didn't they talk about the Tic Tac? OK, why did they talk about David Fravor and these other pilots that chased this thing? They didn't want to talk about that because guess why? They couldn't explain that one. <laughs> they talk about the other things. And then you hear from these intelligence folks. Christopher Mellon just told me and the only reason why he did on camera, he's got a, a clearance now that the that the satellite imageries that they have. I'm like, well, can you give me some indication? Like what? He goes, well, you can imagine like and he's only talking about it because Ratcliffe apparently talked about it. He's like, yeah, 4K of, of an object that we can't explain. Like, you can just imagine. I'm like, it's only a matter of time before some of this stuff leaks out. You know what I mean? For, all the, for all the useless bloody leaks that come out of Washington. I know. My God, right? Oh, but apparently these guys go into their to work. They can't bring their cell phones, any kind of recording devices. They, have, they log on to these computer systems, and they review, like, there's – Part of these UAP task force, they just review this data that just sits on these drives. Um, okay, amazing. Now, you were going to read something, which yes. might be, th is this the first time this paper hears yes. the light of day? Yes. Okay. Yes, w yes, what, yes. What is it? Okay, well, so I have to be very careful because the people that I have met with, um, and I know this person well, uh, this person went on camera for me. Uh, they have to be very, very careful because the NDAs that they are involved with are, are, are pretty serious. But I spoke with this individual and I said, I want to read a statement from you, if I may, because they are very concerned that uh, the lack of transparency with the new uh, arrow, it's the new UAP task force run by a guy named Dr. Sean Kirkpatrick, who they feel... Is, is cooperating too much with the intelligence agencies in terms of uh, information going in and never seeing the light of day. Now, this individual, uh, as, a, as, a, as a sort of a precautionary measure, uh, wants to, as far as he can, uh, inform the general public what's going on behind the scenes, what's his involvement, what he knows, without violating his NDA. So we carefully put this together, um, and, and I'm going to read it to you. You say we, it's all. I, it's, it's, I did it with him. Okay, and it's type. It's typed out like who 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 drafted it. He drafted it, and then I went over it with him. Yeah. Okay. Um, right, here we go. This is pretty juicy. I mean, this is about as juicy. This is pretty juicy. Hello, James. Just wanted to give you a quick shot of the involvement I've had with UAPs. I was introduced to a program while I was in the Air Force that involved Area 51 activities and did that for two to three years. 
My job involved going to a lot of different locations and hearing discussions from a lot of people that are working on very extraordinary technologies and material. Jumping forward to October of last year, I had already been interviewed by the UAP task force to testify in 2022 with the Senate and the House who were passing the new NDAA legislation at the time. I saw all the photographs of this, of, of this individual uh, behind the scenes. I provided them the context of my job and what I had experienced in an effort to give Congress more clarity on the program, which has been particularly difficult to get insight into. After my testimony, I was again asked to speak to the new Arrow organization. So earlier this year, I interviewed at the Arrow office to help them in their study of unidentified aerial phenomena. It's been an extraordinary road for me, to say the least. And I'm doing what I can to help get this out. I will be straightforward that the technologies we have discovered will probably have to stay under classified programs due to national security. But I believe it's time for us all to know that we're not alone. This has been my whole purpose for becoming involved. There's a lot going on behind the scenes, and it's way too much for a lot of folks to take in right now. I'll do my best to, do, to guide any discussions between the powers that are behind all of this, and hopefully my friends who are still in the program will hear this and consider separating the technologies from the contact. I wish you all well, and I hope I'll have an opportunity, an opportunity to open up the discussion of what this is all about very soon. Ordinarily, in, in, a, in a vacuum, one would say this person is delusional. They think yep. they have clearance, which they don't. They think they're in the government. Yeah. And, and I mean, that's always, that's, I mean, I, I'm not to be mean. That's always yeah. the, the, the knee jerk reaction. But then yeah. you're looking but, at. But, but let me, let me take it a little further. Now, I know this individual. This individual is introduced to me by other intelligence folks that I've been working with for some time. I know that he testified. I saw the photographs of him and the intel pit folks with the senators. I've seen this personally. I will vouch for that. He went on camera for me. And now let's talk about the UAP amendment. Now, well, actually, let me just stop you there for one second. I mean, this would be what uh, is behind every New York Times CNN article, an anonymous source. And I say that sort of, yeah, by this would be enough. You have an anonymous source with that you vetted, which yes. you, you'll you you'll attest to with your, how many years are you up to now? 30, 30, 30 years. years. Um, I'm not, I'm not here to, no, I don't, I'm not messing around. I mean, I, why would I do that? I've yeah, got a but, reputation at stake, but Hey, I get it. I totally understand. And look, if your audience doesn't believe me, that's fine. I'm just telling you this is going on and let me put the caveat on there because this, this is the new UAP amendment. Okay. Uh, Rubio, Gillibrand, Gallego, uh, and a number of others were involved with this. Okay. And you can look this up. This was signed into law at the end of last year. B, any activity or any event relating to unidentified anomalous phenomenon and B, any activity or program by department or agency of the federal government or a contractor of such a department or agency relating to unidentified anomalous phenomenon, including with respect to material retrieval, material analysis, reverse engineering, research and development, detection, and tracking, developmental or operational testing. This is in black and white right now. I mean, what prompted this language? Okay, now, let me read another part. This is pretty cool. This is about protection for individuals making authorized disclosures. They shall not be subject to a non-disclosure agreement entered into by the individual who makes the disclosure. So shall be deemed to comply. It's right there. So they're providing whistleblower protection for people just like the person that I just talked about. So basically what they're saying, what this person's saying is, I went and testified. Don't take it from me. I went and testified to Senate Intel, to members of Congress, they call it a skiff that room where you can disclose classified information. Mm -hmm. And I met with the head of the new UAP task force, Arrow, Sean Kirkpatrick, told him, now he, 
this person couldn't disclose these levels of details, but where these programs are, the names of the individuals running the programs, and when he, as far as even saying, if you give me the clearances, I can walk you into these labs. So I'm just saying that this type of stuff is happening right now uh, on the Hill, okay? And, and um, I'm pushing as far as I can, doing my bit, because the public should know. The public should know that these things are going on. The public should know, and they can find out what 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 prompted that that language in the UAP legislation to talk about crash materials or like reverse engineering? Like that's that's a fact. What prompted that? People like you know that are coming forward and talking about these different programs. I mean, I just happened to do a film on on a on an alleged UFO crash. I didn't believe it when I heard about it. I mean, in fact. I was working on my second documentary out of the blue when I heard about this alleged crash in, in Brazil. And I didn't look into it for 11 years because I was like, there's no way on earth that could happen and the whole world not know about it. No way. Well, we are going to have to inform those who may, I, I had never heard of it. For, so we might, we might come back to some of the stuff that we might have missed by, by shifting to this now, but let's shift to Vir right. Virginie. Virginia. Uh, Virginia. So, I mean, that sounds like Virginia. I, I guess it's... I know, right? So, uh, explain what happened here to people who may never have heard of this uh, incident in, in Brazil. So, it's commonly referred to as the Roswell of Brazil. Now, the advantage that we have on this case is that it happened in 1996, January. The vast majority of witnesses are still alive. January 20th, reports come out in the town of Virginia. Virginia is in the state of Minas Gerais. It's about five hours north of Sao Paulo. It was primarily known for coffee. I think the population, about 110,000 people. Uh, it, right in the town of uh, reports of, of these strange creatures. There were a number of uh, farmers, uh, uh, people on the freeway that reported a cylindrical shape, uh, metallic object uh, that appeared to be in trouble. They said that it had, uh, it was about the size of a large school bus, maybe a little bigger, and it had a gash in the side of it, and it had no wings, no like tail, and it was moving erratically, and it was, it just looked like it was going to crash and uh and 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 um uh, there was a gentleman by the name of carlos de Souza who was a ultralight pilot who happened to be traveling from sao paulo he's also a professor of geography and he was going from sao paulo up into the state of minas Gerais for um to, to go uh, fly ultralight airplanes with a group of individuals so he's pretty sure that the date was january 13th um he sees this cigar-shaped object he thinks of secret military craft he doesn't really know and he's driving on the freeway and then he sees it struggling to stay uh, stay airborne and it eventually like goes down and and plows into the side and on a farm he jumps off the freeway he drives up to the location um he said there was a debris field the size of a of a soccer field or football field um lots of little metallic fragments that were like, um, he said they were like aluminum. Um, you could, he, he picked one piece up and he was kind of just feeling it in his hands and he kind of crumpled it up. And he said when it let it go, it regained its uh, shape. And, um, but he said there was a much larger piece that was still intact. And I said, well, how, how much bigger? He's like, it was, you know, I don't know, about a third of the craft, maybe a fourth, third that was still intact. And uh, just as this was happening, he said the stench was, was so strong that he said he had to put his, you know, shirt up and he was trying to hold his nose of sulfur and ammonia. And then uh, he was driven off by uh, military trucks that came in from the opposite direction uh, at gunpoint. Um, and then, then you, a few days later, you start getting reports of these strange beings. They were about four feet tall. Um, they had no hair. They had big 
big red eyes. I know this sounds crazy, right? <laughs> I, I can I can hear I, know I can it. hear the chat. People who I, don't and, I and I'll say this. It sounds nuts. I, I know. I've seen the documentary, I've seen the witnesses. I mean, I've seen the, the people who are claiming to be the witnesses. And it's not that I don't believe them. I in fact do believe them. The only question is, you know, what do you believe of their memory? Or do you believe that they have this memory, but their memory is a distorted, uh, traumatic uh, recollection of what actually happened? Because, you know, I say the, the only, so just to, you know, the, the long story short, there's a military, there's a crash in Virginia, Brazil. Yes. Um, in the days that follow, uh, young women who are now not young women uh, claim to have seen a, an alien being, a, a small, an un unidentifiable being. Yes, an unidentifiable, un unidentifiable being. People who were uh, claiming from the crash that an individual carried the being, uh, or or captured the being. Yes, uh, delivered to authorities. Yes, this individual subsequently died of some bizarre infection. Yes, of the body. There yes. was a stench from the being, from the craft, stench from the being, the craft, the hospital where the being and people were being treated. It people are going to go go watch the documentary. My, you know, the question I have it's the same one I asked before, maybe a, a you know variation 2.0. No photographic, no documentary, no, no photographic, no video evidence. We're in '96 now, so it's mm -hmm. not like point and shoot digital cameras didn't exist or you know everyone had a camera. What could account for that? Well. We uh, we mentioned in the film we could, we were debating on are we going to put this film out without photographic evidence that we know exists or are we going to sit there and hold our breath and wait for that definitive photograph and I opted because the film was pretty much done we had had five solid leads on photographic evidence from both uh, police and um, military as well as doctors and. Um, we, we put a, a significant amount of money on the table and we've got a few people contemplating uh, the, weighing in the risks of, of coming forward. These people are terrified. And I'll remind your audience, first of all, I don't blame them one bit if you don't believe what I'm telling you, because I wouldn't if I were you. But I'm telling you, the testimonial from half the town is incredibly compelling. Extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence? Absolutely. Do we have extraordinary evidence? No. We have a preponderance of incredibly compelling eyewitness testimony. We are looking for that definitive piece of photographic evidence. We've got a bead on it on five different sources, and we have $200,000 cash on the table for it. So I'm not giving up. I'm not going to just like, oh, I couldn't get a hold of it. Of course, I'll continue our pursuit in that. But um you got to start somewhere. I mean, how are you going to even know to ask about some evidence if you don't even know it, it, it happened, if you don't even know it exists? So you have to start the investigation somewhere. I mean, look at Roswell. St there's still stuff coming out on Roswell. And that was 1947. And, there, and a lot of people see this, they go, there's a lot more compelling eyewitness accounts on this case than there are any other cases. I mean, we've got, I mean, look, Leslie Kane, who wrote the, New York Times, one of the authors who wrote the New York Times article that that exposed that secret Pentagon UFO program, she contacted me and she actually went on the record a couple of weeks ago on camera. And she said, because when I was doing this film, she was like, are you sure you want to cover this UFO crash? I said, Leslie, I, you know, I've been there five times and I'm telling you, this is pretty compelling stuff. Well, so she went public, I think about two and a half, three weeks ago, where she utilized some of her deep intel government insiders and they confirmed that it happened and so she went public with that information obviously she can't reveal their names but that she did a little digging herself and found out that this case did happen lou elizondo ran the ufo task force he said that he'd heard that this case had happened in 2009 so um nobody's out there denying it happened or didn't happen right now none of the government intel insiders and we're just you know we're, it's an ongoing investigation. Yeah, we want to get that piece of photographic evidence. I mean, honestly, a lot of people are going to deny it anyway. That, well, that, that's I, I, I'm just saying, even from my own perspective, show me a video. I will say if it if it's too fa if it's too far fetched to believe, I'll say CGI. I know. Uh, you it's know what, what, awesome. I, I, it's it's now what I found most compelling about the documentary. Okay, I'll get to the alien beings in a second. Is yeah. the contemporaneous. Uh, reporting at the time. That, that's what's amazing. I, you know, when I look at it, I don't say this whole thing is, you know, a hoax in that it never happened. I say, okay, fine. There might have been a military crash. When you explain how the USA, uh, USAF is, is alleged to have gotten involved 
come in and you know taken things i can say okay fine there was, there was a military crash secrets they shut it off and that happened they got to cover that up so not an outright hoax fabrication just it happened but people don't know what happened the the the, the witnesses who claim to have encountered en passant the the, the being so, you know they said small big eyes looked terrified uh was subsequently captured i was like okay well there's a part of me that can imagine i'm not saying this to be funny a very yep. small fighter pilot. <laughs> so so a, 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 a short person, skinny person, flying a plane, wearing some like latex suit. They crash. They're a real human. But in that moment of trauma, everyone's like running by. They see this person wearing a suit. And, you know, they might not fabricate, but distort their own memory. Um, the, the, the foul stench, I can imagine. Ammonia, so, some form of chemicals. Maybe it was a, a chemical attack or something. So I, I look for the logical, rational explanation that can fit with what would be the easy to digest pieces of information. Um, and I appreciate the idea of, of running the documentary now because A, no one would be talking about it. B, few people would know that maybe it's going to be not cool, but rather lucrative if there's money on the table. And also people are looking for their excuse to tell the story, but did not feel that they could do it without being labeled Looney Tunes. Uh, and you, you know, you get Rogan talking about it and you'll get access to more information. I get, I guess you're going to get access to a lot more fake stuff as well, but some legit stuff. So I can understand that do a 2.0 sequel if, and when, uh, but you, so you met with all of these witnesses and, so and let me, yeah, I did. And, and and none of the witnesses wanted to come forward. I, I can't tell you how hard it was to get those people to come forward. Some of them were like military X is like, I don't care all the money in the world. I'm never going to come forward. We worked on him for years. Carlos Salza, who watched the UFO crash, he disappeared for 25 years. 25 years. He's the one who identified the site, right? He saw the, the UFO crash, crash identified okay. the site. You know, Military X talks about the, the incident. He drove the body around. You know, he drove. Let me repeat that. He allegedly drove the little creature, alien, whatever you want to call it, around. The doctors are just coming out. The two doctors who worked on the deceased military officer marco sharizi the forensic pathologists said that in their entire career they've never seen anything like what happened to this individual after he uh, reportedly handled one of these creatures they put him in the ground the moment he stopped breathing because they were terrified of whatever bacteria he got on himself from that scratch and they're talking these doctors last week are talking that the ET explanation is probably the most probable. The doctor who worked on the, the military officer, yeah, these guys are here. You want to play it? Yeah, let's play this. I got two statements, so you, you should play them both. Right, here we go. Got some sound? Oh, do, do, hold on. Do, did you not hear sound? I did, I'm not hearing any sound. Uh, there is, oh, uh, cripe. Uh, so there might be an issue hearing sound. I'll read the... Um, it's Port it's it's Portuguese. So yeah, just go ahead and read it. I'll I'll read I'll read the captions. It'll be actually easier. You won't hear the back stuff. Go for okay. it. This is my first statement on the Cherez case, which may have actually involved an extraterrestrial being. But I think the truth has to be really discussed and put forward by the science. I think it's important to take this to the public. It's important to show the truth. It causes strangeness due to the distinct way he describes this bacteria. He has over 70 years of experience and he's never seen this kind of bacteria. I hear the, the actual... Oh, no, here's, here's the other guy, Janini, go ahead. This alien yeah. brought the bacteria in from outside. Okay, so now, now we're, I, I forgot I spliced those two together to, yep, to record yep, them. together. Okay. Yep. This Keep alien on. brought the bacteria in from the outside. Uh, wait, no, that's not, where's, where's the play? Yep, yeah, you're right. There's the character E.T. And there's the character bacteria from E.T.'s fingernails. Right? Because there too, where life exists... There will be the cell structure of life from bacteria to creating a man. We are the evolution. There's evolution in every living world that may exist out there. All right, and that's it. Um, yeah, so 
Now, these doctors provided a long form autopsy report, which Leslie Kane had professionally uh, translated by a medical person. Uh, and those are being examined. And then the two uh, forensic pathologists that you just saw, they are um, willing to cooperate with uh, medical sides here in the U.S. to share more information on this. And let me let me say, those two forensic pathologists are the individuals who dealt with the deceased military person who allegedly picked up the yes potentially extraterrestrial being, got some sort of infection from got a scratch right here, and he died. 23 right. years old. And now, again, w w the, you know, the facts from the not demonstrable facts, the individual lived and the individual died. There's no there's no question about the existence uh, and death of this 100%. human being. Okay. 100%. So th the only question is, what killed him? How did he die? Was it, uh, you know, a military accident? And there's some, you know, biochemical there that that killed this individual. But he, he lived, he died. He was a person. He interviewed his sister. These are the two forensic pathologists who are now explaining what they saw in that uh, military man who died and was buried Fort with or Fort Haste, whatever, post yes. rapidly. Yes. That's uh, newly obtained footage or th yes. that's... Oh, yeah, yeah. We shot that last week. Well, 10 days ago. All right. Uh, uh, fast. I was going to show those on, 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 uh, on Joe Rogan, but we forgot. Um, I, I shared... Uh, the two, I didn't share them on Joe Rogan's show. We we had it all lined up, and we just somehow we for, we forgot to do it. And um, I I did another a brief a couple of days ago. I did I did a uh, a thing where I shared the video. But what what's really going to be exciting is the actual autopsy reports when we have the medical examiners review that data, and they've got questions already. So this is like I'm saying, it's an ongoing investigation. So we just interviewed another doctor two days ago. We have, he has yet to be, we're working with him now. And he claiming to have seen the video of the creature that fellow doctors had taken in Humanitas Hospital. So this is, this is coming out. James, there, someone in our chat on Rubble says, in caps, you forgot that? I mean, look, when you go, you can, you forget things, especially, I mean, it's yeah. not like you didn't lack any detail of the discussion I, with Joe. You know, I tell you <laughs> what, man, we, we had a lot of stuff that we were going to, we were going to go over and, and, and we didn't, I mean, look, I totally, I, I, I knew no. I was, when I came out of the phenomenon, okay. I had a level, level of like government access, uh, Intel access that I never dreamed I would ever have as a civilian. Right. And so I was putting all that on the line, my reputation on the line to report on this case. And I myself had significant, uh, you know, issues uh, even looking into it myself. So I, I completely understand. I don't just expect your audience to say, oh, I believe this guy, James Fox, just because he says a UFO crashed and live no, aliens. I, I, get, I get it. I believe the witnesses. It's just the question at the end of the day in terms of what did the witness, what are they, what are they rem remembering? It's like, it's not that they're fabricating out of whole cloth. It's that there was well, an event. But we have interviews with the girls right after they encountered them the very next day, or maybe even that day. And we show that in the movie within hours of coming face to face in broad daylight. These girls never said ET. They thought it was the devil. They described this thing in vivid detail. There was a person on scene that made an illustration of the of the being. And the girls said it was so close to what they saw that they, they could barely look at it even today. And you see, the, the way I get around that, it, rationalizing that is, I yeah. don't know, maybe the crash released a chemical and everyone was having like a hallucinogenic experience. Like, I think that was an episode of, um, if it's not Northern Exposure, it might have been... Uh, the, what's the David Lynch uh, Twin Peaks? Well, oh yeah, there, yeah. there was a, there was a show where there was there everyone was having a mass hallucination. I mean, if you don't want to, if you if if you want to believe the witnesses but have trouble believing the phenomenon, okay, it was a military vessel that crashed, released a, a, a shit ton of LSD or like the best meth on earth, and everyone had a massive hallucination. That's possible. But you got the doctor who took the X-rays of it. You got the military officer who drove the creature around, who also saw it in the casket. You've got um, uh, the guy who apparently handled it and then died, the scratch, like the bacteria you've got, like if you take any one particular piece of eyewitness testimony, it doesn't really have a lot of weight, but if you take them all, it paints a pretty accurate picture that a UFO crashed 
and beans were recovered. And look, I'm not the the first American to report on this. I mean, kind of publicly I am, but Dr. John Mack, a Harvard psychiatrist, was down in 1996. After within a week or a couple of weeks, he was down in interviewing the the uh, the witnesses on camera. We show some of that in the film. And, and not to write him off, he's he's also a UFOologist. Uh, he, he was into um, UFOs as he well. Was studying the, he was studying the phenomenon and almost cost him his job at Harvard. Um, I actually talked to the Lawrence Spellman Rockefeller family, and they said that. Uh, you know, that Dr. John Mack, just because he was looking into this stuff, almost lost his job. And I understand that, it, that that Harvard got a phone call from Lawrence Spellman Rockefeller reminding them, reminding them of the of the grants they got from the foundation and that uh, that they might not want they might want to reconsider firing uh, Dr. John Mack. Yeah. The more things change nowadays, it's not looking into UFOs that gets you fired. It's liking someone's tweet on Twitter. That you shouldn't like. But it's unbelievable. It's like the guy's just looking into it, like interviewing witnesses, like, wow, there's something going on here. And that's the thing. Like, you know, I look at like um, Neil deGrasse Tyson, who I have tremendous respect for, wonderful physicist, makes it fun for children. Um, he's a he's a he's a treasure, no question about it. But I listen to him talk about. UFOs and UAP and the whole thing. And I cringe. I, I really do. Cause I'm like, no, oh. first of all, we're not screaming for the hilltops. ET has landed, right? We're saying that there is a physical nuts and bolts phenomenon that seems like a handful of cases from around the planet seem to defy a conventional explanation. Okay. We're not saying like where they're from or where they're not from. We don't, we don't really know. Like with the whole Moment of Contact, this latest film I did, I'm just reporting on what the witnesses are saying. And quite honestly, 99.9% .9 of them didn't even want anything to do with me. I mean, it took us 12 years to make this movie. And 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 there wasn't one witness that just came knocking on our door. We went knocking on their door and they just didn't want to talk about it. So there's something truly extraordinary took place in Virginia, Brazil in january uh, 1996 i got one question about uh, one question i'm going to get to in a second but you know the witnesses this is what people who are watching this now might be skeptical about and you can be skeptical as you should be yeah uh the issue is some people say it's not necessarily a good thing that witnesses don't change their testimony 24 right. how many years 25 years later because you know memory does fade others are going to say the fact that they haven't changed their testimony shows the trauma that it left or the, the the impact that it left the bottom line it's not you now making this up they gave they gave testimony in the moments after the the incident there was local reporting oh, yeah. uh, and then it and then it and then stopped so it's like there is a, there is a comparison of what you're finding today versus what was reported at the time and then the question is how do you even account for what was reported at the time something happened okay why were the local media that we interviewed on camera while we're there in virginia why were they threatened if they you ask one more question all your reporters are going to jail why would that happen Look at the press conference at the end with General Lima. I mean, the guy's got guilt written all over his face. He was like, you know, you know when they say, oh, nothing happened here. It's like, I did not have sexual relations. I know I have nothing to hide. Guess what? <laughs> I don't know. The, um, the, the, I forget his name now, but the one who, who brought you to what he thought was the original location of the crash. Carlos de Souza, yes. Carlos de Souza. Now, uh, I'm watching this and I'm the skeptical part of me says how, you know, the landscape of the Brazilian countryside, it's not, I mean, other than the landmark of the white house, which could have, you know, there could be another one built or there could be, it could have been destroyed. Um, metal detecting. I'm like, that's, that's the first thing that goes off in my mind. Cause I've got a metal detector and I love doing that. Do, are you allowed? I mean, has anybody thought about doing that in the yeah, area so, where the. Yeah. I just put out a tweet. My tweet is handle is at, uh, at James C Fox. And I just put the coordinates along with a photograph met for satellite uh, of that area. And I'm asking geologists to get out there with their uh, metal detectors and, and do some research. In fact, I, I was actually in New York City a couple of weeks ago at a, at a conference. And uh, this, this geologist uh, pulls me aside and he goes, he goes, hey, man, I really notice in your movie. And very few people notice this. I flew a drone over that site. I flew drones all over that area just to get an aerial perspective. He said, uh, I could see that the ground from where this guy claimed this object crashed had been significantly altered. 
And you could see it 26 years later from the air. And if you look at the film, Moment of Contact, look at the drone footage over the alleged impact site because it looks very different than all the ground around it. So I highly suggest, and again, this is an ongoing thing that geologists get out there. Go to my my Twitter and you can see the coordinates and and go for it. I'd, I'd be I'd be nervous about getting arrested. Some places have very strict no, rules about, about metal detecting. You no, know, Mylini Farm. I, I go there all the time. You could definitely go walking around, poking around, I, no problem. I, I was just in uh, I was in Tennessee and uh, you know, it's like I, I, they said I asked somebody like you know it's civil war country you can find stuff everywhere but it's illegal to do it on federal property you have to go on private property you need permission and mm. you don't you don't go trespassing up in the, in Tennessee or or in you know in a great many states okay so the, the, where where the phenomenal uh, sorry moment of contact left off yes I mean you got your eyewitness testimony you got your contemporaneous reporting you've got stories people coming out now talking about it you've got um, the autopsy report yes that's four hundred pages. Oh, I don't know. Many, I don't know how many pages the autopsy report is. I'm not I'm entirely sure. They okay. just sent it over and uh Leslie Kane had it translated professionally. I don't okay. know how many pages it is. I haven't I don't know. No, no, and sorry, the only reason I said that is because I thought I remembered there being a document that was a very lengthy document and 400 pages was in my head. So mm. that's the autopsy report on the military guy who died from the infection shortly thereafter. Yes. So we interviewed uh, the doctor who worked on the military officer before he died. Cesario. Cesario said he'd never in his entire career prior or after seen anything like it, that he was throwing antibiotics that normally would knock this out on a perfectly healthy young 23 year old. And it was doing nothing. He did everything he could to save this guy's life. He went on camera, Dr. Cesario. Now, so we have him. He's never seen anything like it. Then we have the two forensic pathologists saying they've never in their entire careers seen anything like it, never seen a bacteria like it. Right. And then we have another doctor coming out and now saying that he's seen video of the creature and he knows where that is. We have firemen that are starting to come out. So it's again, I, I can't emphasize this enough. This is an ongoing developing story and I'm just waiting. I've been sifting through hundreds and hundreds of I opened up my DM on Twitter because I had this guy reach out to me and he goes, James, man, people are trying to reach you. You need to you put that out there on Rogan. You got all these people that want to contact you. It only takes one. I'm waiting for operations on the U.S. side to to really open this up because once that airplane, the name of the uh, military radar control officer was Marco Fetis, F E R E S, and he is the one that reported while I was filming the last time in Virginia. He came forward and said he'd seen this unauthorized. USAF, United States Air Force plane, come in and land in Campinas. Now we've got testimony of the people that drove the body to Campinas. And then a United States Air Force plane, unauthorized from the Brazilian government, lands there. Two helicopters get out, fly to Virginia, grab something, come back from Virginia to Campinas, load something on the USAF airplane, and then the case goes cold once it leaves the United States, once it leaves Brazil to the United States. Uh, have you, have you done any, I mean, I, I asked a question, like I even know how, to, how it would happen in real life. Have you done any FOIA requests? Asking? We're, 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 we're working on that as in the last couple of weeks. All right. Excellent. Now I'm going to bring this one up because I know I had it on the back burner for some reason. Um, this is, uh, okay, hold on. I, I can play this, uh, James. Yeah, absolutely. And you know, there's something that I might want to say, uh, before you hit the play button here. Yep, please. This is something that we realized only on the last trip to Brazil. Upon arrival oh, sorry, sorry. I didn't do that on purpose. Okay, sorry. No problem. And um, so we interviewed a number of people in the town plaza. We also interviewed an entire family of doctors. I think I sent you a photograph of that. And they were talking about later on in the evening, January 20th, like late, late, like 11 o'clock, 12 o'clock, like six hours, seven hours after the girls came in allegedly came within eight to 10 feet of this being and um, military blockades and all this stuff. Uh, we talked to a number of people that said they saw a disc shaped object that was looking for something. And I said, what, do, how do you know? I said to the witness, how do you know it was, what do you mean looking for something? How do you know it was looking for something? They said it was doing this like a grid pattern really low. And so a number of the eyewitnesses you're about to see right now talk about exactly that. Okay, that, that they were seeing something late at night that was doing a grid search could have been a rescue operation pretty crazy 
Well, and some people are say it could have just been a military helicopter looking for, I don't uh, know. It wasn't a helicopter. It was a disc. And you could talk to, I talked to the witnesses. It was not a helicopter. Helicopters make a lot of noise. They disturb the air. This was a, I, look, You I, whatever it was, it was a, according to the eyewitnesses that watched it for five minutes, 10 minutes, 12 minutes, it was a disc shaped object moving silently looking for something. According to them, hit yeah. play. Upon arrival in Virginia, the filmmakers want to hear from locals regarding the alleged 1996 UFO crash. A large monument in the shape of a flying saucer is a clear indication that the town embraces the story. The 1996 Virginia UFO incident. What do you think? Hold on. I, I got to stop. UFO I got to stop right here. Yep. Yeah, that is that is a face mask on the alien statue. <laughs> ah! <laughs> Sorry. The 1996 Virginia UFO incident. What do you think? You fazer um uma manobra a maneuver, a maneuver of that size with so many vehicles involving both army and police simultaneously. He closed the roads and wouldn't let us pass. Something happened that left us very suspicious. I really believe the ET case in Virginia. It was round, a round shape. It was round. And it was turning. It seemed to be looking for something because it came closer. So we were only here for an hour and a half, and I can't believe how many people we got to come forward. What I love about this case is it's recent enough where people either heard accounts or experienced things themselves. All right, people, if that go, if that doesn't make you uh, want to watch, and this is not a, this is not an ad for the, for the uh, it's a great documentary, and everyone will have their own explanations, far fetched hoax or they miss saw. Um, but there was uh, the other thing is presumably there was a demonstrable military operation which can be traced doc to, to documents. Oh yeah, I mean every the whole town. I mean you know, every, so many people like we went downtown plaza, and just started asking questions. We had people lining up around the block at one point. We had we didn't have enough cameras. Like we could have been there for a week with leads of stuff. And, but no, and nobody brought a you know a handheld camera thing of a photograph, nothing like that. Just there are well, it was 1996 in rural. You know, it's early. It's, it's early on. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it wasn't like you know 2005. But uh, there, there, I'm absolutely convinced. I've talked to now five people that we tracked down that did not come to us that have seen the photographic evidence and know where it is. We put money on the table for it. We're doing everything we can. There's nobody on the planet Earth that wants a piece of photographic evidence more than me. I can assure you. The other thing I'll say is let's just let's just imagine for a second if it did happen. How significant would you consider this case? Well, I, I, I'm not saying it, it did or it didn't. If it did, well, I, I would say this. I mean, um, not that people want success and people want to be remembered for having contributed to the world. Uh, your expose of it, if it did, would be pioneering, and it would be, you know, it would be amazing. E even if, incidentally, even if it only turned out to be a military crash with some experimental, you know, whatever, would still be a monumental case that you crack that you expose i mean it would be it would be but if it's real look that's that's the question uh, who james do you know who said it the only thing scarier than life on other planets is no life on other planets was it einstein no i don't but that's a great quote i've heard it before yeah it's, it's amazing and I, I was thinking about it because I'm, I'm at the beach just because you know we're in florida now and i go to the beach because i can that's um beautiful. i love it <laughs> I'm, I, the, I, you know you google they say there's more planets out there than grains of sand on earth and if you imagined that there was only one grain of sand on this entire planet that had life on it, uh, that would be terrifying. I mean, almost more terrifying than if there's, you know, a couple of little grains here and there, you know, one in Australia, one in China, one in California that has earth on it. Uh, mind blowing, but, uh, well, let me, let, James, you obviously are, you're a firm believer. And I say that I ask that with no judgment. So I wasn't, I wasn't, and I refuse to even look into the case. I, I'll remind your audience that I was making my second documentary in the late 90s on the UFO topic. It's called Out of the Blue. You can watch it for free on Tubi and YouTube. But anyway, I was making my second film, and I partnered up with this guy named Tim Coleman. And Tim, we were, you know, when I start a, a film project, I, we, we start with sort of broad strokes, and we think about, okay, what are the, some of the things that we want to cover? How about we'll do this case? We'll look into that case. And then um, he goes, 
my my British friend, he's like, oh, mate, we got to look into that that crash case that happened in this place in Brazil of this UFO, these alien. And I, I just thought, oh, my God, I picked the wrong partner. This guy's nuts. Like, you know, that was 99. And I didn't even read one single word about the case until I was going to Brazil in 2011. Okay. So I was doing, and I did out of the blue. Then I did out of the blue too. Then I did, I know what I saw. I've done four, let's see. Yeah, pretty much four documentaries before I even like would even look into it. And the only reason why I looked into it because I was going to Brazil to give a presentation on something else. On, on I know what I saw. And I had a buddy of mine call me who's been very influential behind the scenes, very high up in the entertainment industry. This guy named Jeff Sagansky. And he goes, Oh, James, you're going to Brazil. You got to look into that Virginia case. And I was like, oh, God, not this again, you know. And so I told Jeff, sure, I'll look into it while I'm in Brazil. That was 2011. And so that's when I flew to Brazil that time. I met with uh, Stanton Friedman, a uh, nuclear physicist, UFO researcher. He happened to be there at the same conference in Brazil. And I started talking to him. And then there were a couple of, like, uh, indirect witnesses on the and, and investigators on the case. And that kind of piqued my interest. And then 12 years later, boom, moment of contact. Uh, do, do you have more time? I don't want to push my luck with you. Yeah, I've got about uh, about 15 more minutes. Okay, excellent. Um, before I ask you, it, well, actually, could you summarize Roswell for those who may not know about it? Because everybody knows of the lore of Roswell, but the actual incident itself, I, I think most people don't, you know. Okay, what I'll tell you, let's go over the facts first. These are everything I can prove. So in July of 1947, the 509th Bomb Squadron, the only bomb squadron in the world at the time, exclusively responsible for the deployment of atomic weapons, was based in Roswell, New Mexico. They put out a press release stating that they'd recovered a flying saucer. And there had been a rash of, of sightings all across the United States. And if you go to any library, any archive, and you look up UFO sightings in in June, July of 1947, they're just, they're splattered over front page of every newspaper. People were speculating what they were, where were they from? Um, there wasn't really the ridicule factor at that point. And uh, so they announced to the world, we, we recovered one of these things. Uh, they, uh, Jesse Marcel, who was the intelligence officer, went out to the, to the debris field with a guy named Mac Brazel, who was the rancher who found this stuff. They went out. They got some of the pieces of it. They brought it back to the base. And they were instructed from the higher-ups to put it in a B-29 and fly it to Wright-Patterson Air Force Base. They put some of this debris on the B-29, and they stopped off on their way to Wright-Patterson Air Force Base. They stopped off at Fort Worth, Texas. And when the plane landed at Fort Worth, Texas, they were there was a flurry of media on the ground. And Jesse Marcel is looking out the window going, my God, there's media everywhere. And there's a general uh, named General Roger Ramey. Uh, Jesse Marcel gets out of the plane. This is all according to Jesse Marcel. And I'll tell you the other guy named DeBose in a second. Gets out of the plane. The media is bombarding him with questions. The general says, you keep your mouth shut. You let me handle this. They go into a room. He throws a conventional weather balloon on the ground. And they have a press conference. They're terribly sorry. What we thought was a flying saucer. Turns out it was just a weather balloon. Our mistake. Our bad. And, and, and you know. Jesse Marcel had to sit there posing with this fake debris, knowing that the real stuff was on the airplane on the tarmac. And uh, they posed with D uh, DuBose, Colonel DuBose, Major Jesse Marcel, and, G and General Roger Ramey. Well, DuBose and Major Jesse Marcel went on camera uh, before they died, obviously, and said, the original story was true. What we found was not of this earth. And uh, we, we, we it was covered up. So those are the facts. And then since then, there have been like, I don't know, a couple of hundred witnesses. I went to the 50th anniversary of Roswell that happened in 1997, and I talked to probably, I don't know, 15 or 20 different people that were there. And um, another part of, of, of Roswell that a lot of people are unaware of is that um, Apollo 14 astronaut Edgar Mitchell, who I'd interviewed on a number of occasions, grew up in Roswell. He was the sixth man to walk on the moon. He also had deep intel connections from his time with NASA. And he had told me on camera that what, what crashed there was not of this earth. And when he got back from the moon in the early seventies, 
he went back to where his childhood area where he grew up and he knew those ranchers and he said the ranchers all said it was not of it was not of this earth and there have been a number of of, of memos that have leaked out one in particular that caught my eye was uh july of 1947 by j edgar hoover in his own handwriting you can google it and it says um such and such in the s it looks like sw case could be southwest where the army grabbed it and wouldn't let us have it for cursory examination it talks about this so there's a lot of very compelling firsthand eyewitness testimony uh, of roswell and the very uh people that reported on the recovery of a flying disc were the most highly trained hand select unit on the planet at the time people that would not confuse an everyday weather balloon and look, in 1995, the, there was a 94, 95, the government put out another report because the Clinton administration was pressuring to try to come up with, with answers for Roswell. And Roswell was getting a lot of attention at the time. And they came up with this new thing called Project Mogul. Well, Project Mogul is exactly the same material of a conventional weather balloon from 1947. It's just a bunch of them strung together. People think that Project Mogul is some exotic looking weather balloon. It's not. It's exactly the same balsa wood and tin foil paper as the original, um, you know, uh, weather balloon, except a bunch of them, just a whole bunch of them strung together. So Roswell, that's that's Roswell in a nutshell. Okay, interesting. And now I'm, I'll ask you this. I got two questions, then we can call it quits. First of all, I don't want to start a fight. What's the deal with Stephen Greer? Someone was very, really wanted me to ask about, about Stephen Greer. Well, Stephen Greer has been at this a while. Um, uh, you know, some people think of him as a as somewhat of a controversial uh, character. I think he rubs some individuals the wrong way. Very smart guy. Um, I think that some people feel that um, some of the information he puts out is a bit questionable. Although some of the information he puts out is 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 uh, is right on point. I'm told. So um, uh, you know, uh, he has his methodology and, and, and his tactics, and I think he's he's been effective in some areas and and probably less effective in others. Okay, that's that's all I need. I just I, I wasn't sure if there was beef that I wasn't aware of. Um, okay, here, here's the, the the real metaphysical question, James. Yes. Some people out there might think that all of this it's real in the sense that it might be something of a psyop. The government, you know, every now and again sets these events up so that people start talking, chattering. They can use it as the ultimate distraction. And that the, the events themselves are that which are intended to get people whipped up in a fury to either discredit people who buy into it or just to distract people uh, who do end up buying into it. And that you might be chasing a white dragon in terms of like the holy grail of evidence that doesn't actually exist. Or some people might think you're in on it with the government to distract people. We'll, just, we'll back that one up a step. But that you might be chasing a white dragon that doesn't exist. Okay, so I'll address that question with two responses. One, there is absolutely, beyond a shadow of doubt, no question that there is a technology exhibited dating farther back. You could look up historical cases, but let's just say the modern UFO wave in the 40s, that you have objects that exhibit a technology that defies our understanding of flight, uh, of conventional propulsion. you got objects that have no wings. They have no tails, no exhaust vents, no visible means of propulsion that could do right angle turns at high speed, thousands of miles an hour, that could stop on a dime, accelerate from a standstill to out of sight in the blink of an eye. These objects have been recorded going from 80,000 feet to sea level in the snap of a finger, okay? That's over, there's overwhelming evidence of that. So it would either be an indication that China, or Russia, or some unknown department within the US government has been in possession and flying these objects uh, secretly for 80 years. That's a big story in itself. Now, the other aspect of it, and this is in the own files of the United States Air Force, is that they were categorized into three categories: sightings. Okay, this is by the this is by the scientific advisor to Project Blue Book, Dr. Jalen Hynek. Close encounter of the first kind. 
When someone sees a UFO at close range, close encounter of the second kind, someone sees a UFO and the UFO interacts with the environment, whether it leaves burnt marks on the ground, radiation on the face, like in Richard Dreyfuss case on close encounters, um, imprints, that sort of thing. It interacts with the environment. Close encounter of the third kind, and there are many cases, I've looked into a few myself, around the world, is when the witness report beings associated with the craft. So you have extremely credible cases, not all, but some extremely credible cases, extremely credible eyewitness reports, sometimes multiple eyewitness reports in broad daylight of beings associated to the craft. So those, again, your audience, the vast majority of these things can and have been explained. I get that. There are weather balloons, spy balloons, there are all that stuff. But there's a core 5 10% of cases that after exhaustive investigation, after not because of a lack of data, but because of a lack of a conventional expl explanation that just defy a conventional explanation. And those are the cases that we, that, we, that we focus on. And those are the cases that make the case that a certain percentage of UAP or UFOs originate from a non-human intelligence. And the government knows it. And I'll ask you this, well, by the way, before we get to the last question, in our locals chat, two possibilities exist. Either we are alone in the universe or we are not. Both are equally terrifying. Arthur C. Clarke. Ah, I love it. Okay, perfect. That makes yeah. sense. I'm going to screen grab that so I don't forget it. And then uh, 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 Stephen Briton says, to cross the vast distances between stars, alien technology must be incredibly advanced. I have real trouble understanding why they would bother. Uh, with an utterly insignificant little blue-green planet with ape-descended life forms, so primitive, they still think iPhones are pretty neat ideas. Well, let me ask your, your that guy a question. How do you know they're coming across the vast distance of space? How do you know that? Because I don't. Well, I, and this is what this happens, is what happens if they're in a slightly parallel universe. Maybe they're in a slightly different dimension. I'm not saying I know. I'm not saying that anybody knows. But how does he know that they're traversing the vast distances of space? We don't. Well, they, they could. I, I was listening to Rogan with. There's uh, a phenomenon. We don't. We don't have an explanation for it. We don't know. Uh, to to the people who laugh. I mean, to the people who scoff at the idea. Like, I, I think it's like fifty percent of the water on Earth came from outer space on meteorites. So, like, fifty percent of the water that's currently on Earth was extraterrestrial water. We know that water carries life. So, the idea that there wouldn't be bacteria on space water meteorites itself is, you know, equally laughable. Um, and then where do you take it from there? You know, bacteria on Mars is not exactly, you know, light, whatever. Um, and then I was listening to Rogan with the doctor. Uh, I'm going to script his name, the Japanese. Uh, 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 Michio Kaku. Michio Kaku. First of all, I still don't understand what quantum computing is. I mean, I swear to you, I, I feel like an idiot. They say words and I don't understand the damn thing about what quantum computing is. They're talking about wormholes. That I can understand a little better. Uh, okay, but James, last question. Yes. Um, you have to have one piece of evidence that is the most compelling or was the most convincing in your life? Can you name it offhand? In terms of a photograph? Yeah. Let's say, I, yeah. I would have to say McMinnville, Oregon, uh, 1950, Evelyn and Paul Trent took two or three uh, photographs of a disc-shaped craft. It's been analyzed to death. They never made a dime on it. Two eyewitnesses, broad daylight, two or three high resolution uh, photographs of a disc. And I think it's pretty compelling. This, this one right here. Yeah, that one. That, that, that's, a, that's a low res version of it. But yes, that's it. Uh, and, and you listen to Evelyn Trent and her husband, Paul, and the testimony of it. It's, it's pretty damn compelling. And it's been analyzed to death, particularly by the Condon Committee, by Project Blue Book. And they've never been able to prove it being a fake. Um, you know, there, there are others, Rex Heflin, 1965, Santa Ana, California, a couple of Polaroids, pretty impressive stuff. Um, hey, there's a photograph. There was a case that happened in 2006 at O'Hare Airport where you had a disc-shaped object hovering over Terminal 17 and, a and, and half the crew of United Airlines, including pilots, who saw this disc in broad daylight that hovered over the terminal. And when it departed, it punched a donut hole in the cloud. And there was a guy that found the FAA, the, the tapes from the people talking about it in the tower. And there's, there's a photograph of that somewhere that we're, we're, that we're looking for. But nope. there's a bunch of, yeah, you got that one? 
I, well, I, I can't. Oh, 2006. I can't. Yeah, yeah. Sorry. Yeah. So that's a that's a really good case. Where I saw a picture somewhere that popped up. Yeah. I, I'm, I'm going to look into this after. Yeah. Later. Anyway, you can look at my own. That. There's a handful of very, very good cases over the decades. I, I, I talked about them on, on, on Rogan, making my case that some of these objects uh, defy a conventional explanation and, and probably originate from a non-human intelligence. And the reason why we say non-human intelligence, because we don't know they're extraterrestrial. We don't know they're from another planetary. We don't know, right? If it, maybe they originate around us. We, we just simply don't know. So... James, where can people find you? And then I'm going to ask you to send me your link so I can put them into the uh, pinned comment. But where can people find you? They can find me uh, at James C. Fox on Twitter. Um, Moment of Contact is on Amazon and iTunes and Vimeo and Google and Fandango. Now, if you're going to rent it, get it from Amazon. It's, it's just a few bucks. But if you're going to buy it, get it from iTunes or Vimeo because it comes for the same price with two hours of bonus material. Oh, um, son of a, I yeah, people I, go, I, people go, damn it. I bought it on Amazon. I didn't realize, you know, like a dollar more on iTunes or Vimeo and you get all this bonus material for no extra cost. So I would definitely, and if your audience wouldn't mind taking a moment to review us on, um, on iTunes or something, that's, that's always tremendously helpful. I, I will go ahead and do that now. And I think I'm going to go buy the extra, the added feature stuff as well. Uh, James, amazing. If and when there's a follow-up, please do me the honor of coming back on and talking about it because I, I love it. I, I, I mean, I know what I believe. I know what's more probable than not. I know what's provable and what's been proven. Uh, I know what I want to believe. And I also know what I have to remain healthily skeptical about, even when it comes to stuff that I want to believe. So we got to continue holding the government's feet to the fire. The evidence is there. I'm going after it. I'm not alone. There are a lot of other people that are going after it. Our elected representatives are now going after it. So this is going to be a very exciting next couple of years. Mark my words. Phenomenal. Thank you. Stick around. We'll say our proper goodbyes. Everyone in the chat, thank you very much. And I'll see you guys on the interwebs tomorrow.